So, uh, Lee, I was wondering if you could come up here and maybe have a seat. The, the next part of the program is a video about the common turns, and I think you have heard me in the past, Save the River has been involved in a program to preserve and restore the common turns. And this summer, we were very fortunate to have Elaine Tack, who I think a lot of you know, a longtime river partner, come to us and say that she would like to do a, a video on it. And Elaine's had a successful 14-year broadcasting career reporting and anchoring the news in LA, Las Vegas, Cleveland, and Chicago, and using her education in photography, editing, and broadcast journalism, Elaine began making her own storytelling films. Today, she's a filmmaker for hire, creating films quickly and creatively. And she has grown up on the river and happily donated her skills, times, and talent to tell a story about the river community and save the river. And this film that you're going to see is being debuted today in the North Country. It was accepted and shown at the Wildlife Conservation Film Festival in New York City in October, and it won honorable recognition. The Canadian Shorts Film Festival is, is a finalist for that. It's also been submitted to quite a few other environmental film festivals. Elaine was going to be here today, but because of the weather downstate, she couldn't make it. And so she did a brief introduction to the film. So you'll get to hear it directly from Elaine. Hi, I'm Elaine Tack. I am the filmmaker of It's Hard to Be a Turn. It's said that a picture is worth a thousand words. And in today's world where everybody has an iPhone and they can make pretty pictures, a lot of people think they're filmmakers. But a pretty picture doesn't always tell the whole story. And that's where someone like me comes in, the documentary filmmaker. Because creating a film is not just about pretty pictures. It includes sound bites, natural sound, and telling the complete story so it makes sense. Here's how it works for me. As the documentary film process begins, I try not to have too many expectations. I want to have open eyes and ears so I hear and see everything. Because I believe that the story tells itself. And then I take it, shoot it, write it edit it into a semblance that makes sense for you. When I began shooting the Common Turn Restoration Program, we started on an early morning at Foxy's. That, that's a big deal in life, um, too, because if the wind's strong, it's cooling the eggs off. John Peach, Kate, Dershin, and I all boarded a boat. I didn't have a clear picture of what I'd be shooting to tell the story, so I started with boat shots, approaching the nesting shots, people shots, and then, of course, the birds, lots of birds and natural sound of the team tagging the common turns and talking with each other. We traveled to the various sites getting a variety of shots and interviews, but it became clear to me I'd need more. Over the next couple of days, we shot more, some from my jet ski. It was great stuff. After all that shooting, my priority became getting pictures of a young baby turn being born, and also getting the founder of the program, Lee Harper, and seeing him in action. So one bright sunny afternoon with two of his associates, we headed out for what would help tell more of the story. At that point, I was also stuck for a title. I didn't know what I would call the film. But as we were headed out with Dr. Harper in his boat, serendipitously, there was a bit of bird drama. And this is how it happens in documentary filmmaking. You never know when a moment will happen. Oh, boy, it's hard to be a turn, that's for sure. And that's when Lee Harper gave me my title. This is how documentary filmmaking happens, in small, distinctive moments. Like the moment Kate tags the bird and gives yeah, it a I, kiss I farewell. Yep. That tells the story without any words. If you're careful and you do it right. It happens when Lee shows me how tagging doesn't hurt the birds. It was a question that had to stand out in my mind because watching them be tagged, it looks like it would hurt. Moments put together in a storytelling sequence makes the documentary film entertaining, educational, and informative. I learned so much from all the teams working with the Common Turn Restoration Program, and I also learned that these kind of programs face threats, including funding. 
And what a shame it would be for our Thousand Islands to lose programs like these. I'm really sorry I couldn't be there today. I had my airplane book, I had my car book. I was even having a sleepover with Dan and Lauren Troop, which I'm really bummed I missed. But snow got in the way. I hope my film is something you learn from and that you enjoy. And I want to thank everybody involved with the program because you made my job easy. Bye. For centuries, common terns kissed the skies above the St. Lawrence River. For thousands of these water birds, the river is where life begins. Once you pick up a baby turd and you look at them and you realize that these birds can live into their 20s, they fly thousands of miles every winter to South America, and then they come back, and they come back very often to the exact same island and nest again. Uh, they're really quite remarkable. They're one of the animals on the river here that's really quite special. In the early 1900s, the common terns all but disappeared because of hunting. But protective legislation in the 1920s and 30s brought the, the terns back. The head of the island up there. 30 years later, the terns faced other threats. A lot of birds were affected severely by DDT and by other, uh, or, uh, other chemicals and contaminants. Uh, terns probably were affected as well. In 1989, Dr. Lee Harper began a program to restore the tern population to the St. Lawrence River. Oh, no, it's a peregrine falcon. It's a peregrine falcon. Oh, no way. Oh, boy, it's hard to be a tern, that's for sure. The biggest change in the tern colony was probably the increase in ring-billed gulls. Gulls are larger. They nest two weeks earlier than terns. Uh, and they can exclude terns from the primary nesting sites on islands. Dr. Harper has been working with threatened and endangered species his whole life. There's another one. There's a second. There's the second. When the program began, Dr. Harper and his team counted only 400 nesting pair of terns. But Harper and his team found it's a very big river. He realized he couldn't do it alone. No single agency or group or entity could do it on their own. So 10 years after he began, 60 miles upstream from Messina, New York, where he follows turns, just outside of Clayton, New York, volunteers and staff from Save the River, working with the Thousand Islands Land Trust, the River Edge Association, and other volunteers began working together to restore the turns. Save the River started monitoring common turns in 1999. There are 14 to 21 nesting sites along the St. Lawrence. Save the River monitors six uh, common turn nesting sites, which includes two natural shoals, so natural islands that they nest on, and four navigational cells that have been restored to be able to uh, be a, a suitable nesting site for common terns. Like Dr. Harper, volunteers and staff from Save the River tag the birds to monitor them. Right. Common terns are a New York State threatened species. They are not federally listed. And by tagging them, we give researchers the information that they need on fledging and productivity and nest pairs. Ouch, it looks like it hurts the birds. Oh no, they're not hurting. Our presence stresses them out, but it doesn't hurt whatsoever. You see how loose the band is? And it, it's turns and it, of course their feet are very large when they're born, when they hatch. And so the birds will grow. The band is not tight on them now and their legs won't grow much, if any at all. They may actually shrink a little bit as they get older. And those individually numbered bands, uh, we've banded this year we'll probably ban our 39,000th turn chick, which is incredible over the years. We've got band returns from, oh gosh, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, even Argentina. In 2015, the entire river team counted and recorded over 1,100 pairs of nesting turns along the St. Lawrence River. So we've more than doubled the population. It's gone up and down since then. We've had some issues with competitors and predators, but by and large, we have just tremendously increased the number of breeding pairs on the St. Lawrence River. They did it together with wildlife management. Just by simple things, little management issues, the fencing to keep the chicks from falling off, the 
wires to help prevent uh, some of the predators from getting the chicks. The little wooden teepees of the shelters, so they have, a, they have shade from the sun and the rain and that sort of thing. It's, it's really helped increase their productivity and, and produce a lot more chicks every year. Quite a bit of work that go into each nav cell and each shoal that we prepare pre-season before the common terns come back to nest. Even with all the hard work, there are still threats to the terns, and it's not just from predators. Money support is always an issue and threatens the life of this program. This project is primarily funded by volunteer organizations and by the state of New York, both the Department of Environmental Conservation and the New York Power Authority. And there are other threats from us. The human part of that equation when the birds started to make their resurgence, so many of the shoals that were their natural rookeries were built upon. And obviously people aren't going to give up their beautiful homes and houses for the birds. It's hard to be a turn. Dr. Harper says swirling in the skies is another threat. Where the St. Lawrence River begins, just across from the U.S. and upstream from the American Turn Restoration Project, Wolf Island in Ontario, Canada, sits in the middle of what is described by environmentalists as part of a bird migration superhighway. Since 2009, 86 wind turbines have been installed and are blowing into this bird flight path. The most recent 2017 study released by the Wind Energy Bird Monitoring Database shows that in the first year of operation and after three years of monitoring, this wind farm recorded the highest rate of bird casualties of any wind project in Northeast America. Should you care if turns take flight or fail? According to Dr. Harper, turns matter because he says they're one part of what keeps our fragile ecosystem healthy. And right now, he says, they can't make it on their own. This turn management and monitoring program is an effort to help restore the turn population to a level where the birds can be removed from the endangered species list and fly on their own. The project has really benefited over the years through a lot of cooperation between state and federal agencies and volunteers and organizations. And that framework is very, very important. It's a cooperative effort that's been very successful and I hope it continues. Thank you, Elaine. Even though she isn't here, Lee, would you come up for a minute in case anybody has any questions? One other person I want to recognize is Patricia Schulenberg down here, our program manager, who runs all of our volunteers, and she does a great job of keeping this end of the river's effort going. Uh, well, uh, Kate Brahaney, you couldn't be here with us today. I think a lot of you know Kate. She's worked for us for years. Now she's working with Tilt, uh, but she is just the most enthusiastic volunteer to have us go out there, and she, uh, you know, she's a key part of this program. So are there any questions for Lee? I think a lot of you know him. He's been here for years and spoken many times. Lee? Just out of curiosity, indulge me for a minute. How many of you, just by a show of hands, have been out to a turn colony with Jim or Susie or Tilt or Save the River? Yeah, quite a few. Wow. Wonderful. It's been a great project, and it could not, uh, we could not have achieved what we have achieved without your support. So thank you very much. Um, I was wondering what efforts are being made to reduce the mortality from the windmills. Are there, um, you know, is there some kind of technology to help reduce that? Yeah, this, this is a tough one, and uh, I think the answer is, in general, no. It's very difficult. Uh, there's some good literature on turns and windmills out of Germany and out of Europe where the, there is significant mortality, and it seems to be biased slightly between male and female turns for reasons that aren't quite clear. But uh, it is an increasing threat. Is there a way to try to teach them an alternative route? I mean, I just as a teacher, read a book with students where they actually came up with an alternative um, 
route for whooping cranes. Um, is that possible? It would be more difficult with terms than with whooping cranes. The cranes, I think, was that the project where they flew with an ultralight yeah. and caught the new migration route? Sorry, that's, that was really quite innovative. It'd be a lot harder with terms. They're more dispersed, there are a lot more of them, and they probably take many different routes. But that was a great project. It's been my understanding that some of the populations have ebb and flow on the nav cells. Can you talk about what that cause might be or cause this? You're exactly right, David. Um, we had tremendous success at navigation cells 156, 180, the project you were involved in a very long time ago. And those sites have really been done very well with Jim's management. Um, recently, we've started to see more predators key in on these sites in particular peregrine falcons. So we've got a situation where peregrine falcons uh, last year and three years ago would depredate the terns during the day and then great horned owls would hit them at night. And there are a couple of spots that really took a hit. So traditionally terns will move from island to island or nesting site to, from, to nesting site based on predation from the previous year. And the problem now is we're simply running out of sites. We need more space. We need to identify new shoals that might be enhanced with a little bit of gravel or turn nesting boxes or chip shelters, that sort of thing. See if we can, can increase the number of nesting sites on the river. So if one site gets hit by peregrines, they can move to another. Michael Twist over there. Um, Hello, Michael. Fascinating to report all this. It's birds and it's environments. It's great to see. And, and I really enjoyed seeing what people <laughs> I'm jealous. Me too. Yeah. Um, I have a question about, like, from the 60s and 70s, we've seen those images of crossbills and mutilated deformed um, birds, water birds. Um, do you see any evidence with all these chicks that you're handling all the time of, of deformities to a level that might indicate that there's still some problem with contaminants in the environment? That's a very good question. Uh, there's a lot of concern about crossbills and terns and in cormorants, things that tend to eat fish and bioaccumulate these contaminants. We've handled almost 39,000 tern chicks. I've seen it twice. Uh, one of those chicks, um, I called some Canadian Wildlife Service colleagues. They came right down with a tank of liquid nitrogen. The animal would, would not survive. It can't feed itself. We sacrificed the animal, ran all the tissues, and it did not have high concentrations of anything that we could identify. Um, so we also collected turn eggs in 2016 and ran them for PCBs. The levels of PCBs are way, way down over a decade ago or two decades ago, and probably not at a level now where we think it's contributing to deformities. But I've seen two out of 38,800 chicks that we've banded. So the, the incidence is lower here than it is in other areas of the Great Lakes, which is a good thing. All right. We've got time uh, for one more. Yeah, well, thanks again, Lee. I take my hat off to you because over the years, going up and down the river, I've seen not so much you, <laughs> but, but your students, your grad students, your volunteers and all all out there working, and the thing that I find uh, very inspiring is it's always, it's not necessarily very nice when they're out there. It's misty, it's foggy, it's damp, it's damp, it's dreary, or it's hot sun, uh, and they're there in all different uh, environments working hard at a wonderful project, and uh, I thank them, and I thank you, and I also, I hope to see you I have a message for you from the Hawk Watchers at uh, Derby Hill and Kiptobe. <laughs> Terrific, thank you. I tell you, you really brighten our day when you go by and blow the horn for us. It's, <laughs> it's always a nice street up there. Thank you.